Okay, today we'll be talking about masses on springs and the pendulum. So the first thing we're going to do is look at a mass spring system and see if we can analyze what's actually happening during the motion of a mass spring system. And we're going to look at three distinct positions. A is where it's stretched out to a maximum displacement x. Uh, B is where it's back in the equilibrium position and C is where the uh, spring is compressed. So I want you to look and ask yourself a, a series of questions. First being is, where is the force maximum? Well, where the displacement is maximum. Why is that? Well, we know that force is equal to kx, or Hooke's law. Um, I left out the negative sign because we're only really worried about the magnitude. Okay, So that occurs at both A and C where the displacement is maximum, either positive or negative. Where's the force minimum? Where the displacement is zero, the same idea. F is equal to kx, and if uh, x is zero, then obviously the force is zero. And that occurs at b, at the equilibrium position. All right, let's ask another question. Where's the acceleration maximum? Well, that would occur where the force is maximum because acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. So wherever that force is greatest, the acceleration will be greatest. And once again, that occurs at A and C. Where is the acceleration minimum? Where the force is zero. And where is the force zero? Back at the equilibrium position. So that occurs at point B. So we have maximum force and maximum acceleration at the two extremes. And zero force and zero acceleration at the equilibrium. All right, let's try another question. Where's the velocity maximum? That would occur where the displacement is zero. Um, and that would be B, because the whole time it was out here, it was speeding up till it got to this position here. And then obviously it starts slowing down as the spring compresses. So where's the uh, velocity minimum? Well, the two, um, extremes at A and C uh, because it has maximum di displacement and when you think of it this way it must stop um, moving before it can change directions so it was going out say and now it's coming back so it has to stop at the two ends so that occurs in A and C all right where's the kinetic energy maximum well, obviously, where the velocity is maximum, because the mass of it's not going to change. So wherever the velocity is maximum, the kinetic energy will be maximum, and that occurs at B. Where's PE, or potential energy elastic maximum? Where the displacement is maximum, because then it would be elastic potential energy, or 1 half kx squared. So that would be at A and C. And where is the mechanical energy maximum? And hopefully remember this. It's constant right? So it's only changing forms back and forth. All right. And this is true with a pendulum as well. Think of a pendulum being pulled out. It's the same thing as a spring being pulled out. The pendulum hanging straight down, the same as the mass being on the uh, spring being at its equilibrium position. And you can see the correlation between the two. All right. So now what I would like you to do is take a moment look at these questions and see if you can determine where this occurs, like where is the acceleration greatest. Okay, you can actually pause the video if you want and take a moment to think about it. All right, here we are back. Everything, all the answers are A and C. Okay, um, hopefully you did well. All right, moving on. Let's talk about frequency and vibration. So is there a general format that all objects in simple harmonic motion follow? Well, we can utilize Newton's second law and Hooke's law together. We know that the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration, or the sum of the forces is equal to kx for Hooke's law. So these two actually must be equal to each other. The maximum acceleration occurs where the displacement is maximum, as we discussed before. So wherever we have maximum acceleration, we have maximum displacement. 
So let's see how we can use that. Here's our equation again. And now we're going to replace x and a, a, uh, x or acceleration of the x with their maximum simple harmonic terms. From the previous video, you know that um, acceleration maximum is just equal to the amplitude. And ex uh, excuse me, displacement maximum is equal to the amplitude. And acceleration maximum is equal to minus a omega squared. And they come from these two equations. Here, if this term is 1, then a is equal to the maximum displacement. And if this term ends up being 1, the maximum acceleration is minus a omega squared. So if I put the two terms in and set the two sides equal to each other, the negatives cancel out, the a's cancel out, and I'm left with omega equals square root of k over m. Okay? And this is the formula that they talk about in the book. Um, but I'm going to change it around a little bit because it's not what's on the AP formula card. Um, so I would like to try to derive the formula that's on the AP formula card. And I'll do that on the next slide. It's really the same formula. So we started with omega is equal to square root of k over m. And we know that k is obviously the spring constant and m is the mass. And we know that omega is the angular frequency, um, which is equal to 2 pi f or 2 pi times the frequency. So I can replace do that replacement. And I also know that the frequency is also equal to the reciprocal of the period. So I can make a substitution there. And I can replace f with 1 over period. And then I can take this equation and I can solve for period. Now here is the equation that you see in your formula card. But it actually is the same as this equation, it's just rewritten. Okay? All right. Let's summarize this equation. Okay, we know that period is equal to 2 pi radical m over k, where m is the mass of the object. And if m increases, so does the period. So this should make sense to you. Um, if you have a heavier object, it's going to take longer to go back and forth. Okay? Um, and k is a spring constant. So if you increase k, the period will actually decrease which means it will go back and forth faster, which makes sense as well if you think about it. If you have a really stiff spring, it's going to spring back and forth really quick. Something else I want you to notice about this equation um, that I find interesting is that there's no reference to the amplitude of the displacement. And that's because it dropped out in our derivation, if you remember that. All right, so we're going to try a really interesting example. This is how astronauts have to weigh themselves, excuse me, mass themselves in space. Um, if they tried to stand on a scale, they'd just float off it. As a matter of fact, look at all these little handy holds or footholds throughout the space uh, station to have them hold on. Um, so they couldn't just stand on a scale, they'd float off. As a matter of fact, look at her hair floating around. So they use this uh, spring chair to figure out what their mass. It's pretty an pretty interesting idea. Um, the device consists of a spring-mounted chair in which the astronaut sits. The spring has uh, a constant of 606 newtons per meter, and the chair has a mass of 12 kilograms. And when they set it going back and forth in motion, it has a period of 2.14 seconds. So the period is directly related to how much mass she has. So what I'd like to do is try to find out what the mass of the astronaut is. All right, so I'm going to start with my equation. I'm going to solve it for the mass of the astronaut in the chair. All right, so I squared both sides and I got the m out, um, and I solve for m. If you need to take a moment to pause it and look at that math, you can. And then I put the values in. I put in uh, the k, the period, over um, 2 pi squared. And it came out with a mass of 89.2 kilograms. But that's not the mass of the astronauts because we need to actually subtract the mass of the chair. So it would be 89.2 kilograms minus the mass of the chair. And here's the mass of that astronaut. So it's kind of neat how they do that. Um, we talked about a lab doing that too. All right. Do pendulums follow simple harmonic motion? 
they do if their linear restoring force is um, if their restoring force is linear and it's not affected by the amplitude. So if we look at the weight of this guy, this pendulum, little pendulum bob on the bottom, it can be broken into two components: one on the x, one on the y. The one on the x is the linear restoring force. This force is almost directly proportional to the angle it's brought out. Um, it's not exact, but it's really close when it's under 20 degrees. So we can consider a linear restoring force for less than 20 degrees. All right, so let's look at the equation for the period of a pendulum. Um, period is equal to 2 pi radical L over G, um, where L is the length of the pendulum and G is the gravitational constant. And I just want to sh draw some analogies to the uh, equation for a mass on a spring. You can see that they're, they're very similar um, uh, because they were really derived the same way. So anyhow, L is the length of the pendulum, as I said, and as the L increases, so does the period. So the longer the, the pendulum is, the period will increase. So um, that's kind of obvious. If you have a very long pot pendulum, it's going to take a long time to go back and forth. G is a local gravitational constant. So the bigger the G is, the shorter the period will be. It's kind of almost like the restoring force of a spring. Like you can think of the analogous between gravity and the restoring force. Both these are like restoring forces, the K and the G, and the L is analogous to the mass, right? Some other things to note. Um, there's no reference to amplitude of displacement. Um, so like if you take a pendulum and bring it back five degrees, 10 degrees or 20 degrees, it's gonna be the same uh, period. As long as you remain within about 20 degrees from the equilibrium. Okay. And mass is not in the equation. So like if you have a really heavy object, a really light object, it doesn't matter. Mass, it does not matter in a pendulum. The only thing that matters is length and the gravitational constant. So let's try an example. Um, determine the length of a simple pendulum that will swing back and forth in simple harmonic motion with a period of one second. So we want it to swing back and forth and have a period of one second. So there's our equation. Um, I'm going to solve it for the length. Okay. And we're going to use our standard gravity. And that's how long the pendulum would have to be.